Well, thank you. Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Now, I'm getting a lot of attention about being old. I never have considered myself to be old. I don't look old. I don't feel old. I don't act old. I don't think old. But when your grandson shows up at Thanksgiving at your house with his granddaughter that's just been born, that makes you old whether you like it or not. I am a great, great grandfather now at 94 in five months. And uh, somebody asked me the other day, are you a senior citizen? I said, I got four kids that are senior citizens. <laughs> I, I flew down to Tampa uh, in January and rented a car and drove to Kissimmee to visit my younger brother. He's only 90. And we are working on a trip to Westchester, Pennsylvania to visit our older brother who's 96. So we got a lot of folk living older. And I remember Dr. B.R. Lakin said when he got old, he said, I'm going to find out where I'm going to die and I'm not going to go there. <laughs> and then he said, almost everybody dies in the hospital and I'm not going in there either. <laughs> Look in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 and it says, if... Now, there's a suggestion here that possibly somebody hadn't done this, but really it carries a connotation of sense. So think of yourself now, if you have been risen with Christ, and that's speaking to us as Christians, it's insinuating that somebody might not be, so if you haven't been, but let's look at it from since you have been, and hope that that fits everybody. Since you have been risen with Christ, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things here on the earth. Now the apostle is telling us, get your mind off all of the problems and burdens and situations and circumstances. Everybody's got lots of problems and and. Uh, He's telling us, once you get your mind off of uh, hospitals and hospice and get your mind off doctors and arthritis and off of wheelchairs and walkers and canes and crutches and social security checks and retirements and wills and undertakers and funerals and caskets and graves and long COVID and cancer and strokes and heart attacks and bypasses and, and uh, all that. Get your mind off that. How are we going to do that? And that stuff really dominates our thinking and our time. I'm going to leave here and go home and take my wife to Vanderbilt Hospital on Wednesday for two very serious tests. And uh, it reminded me, I was sitting in my office one day, and uh, I got up and walked by the secretary's desk and I said, Doc, I'm going to be out a little bit. Where are you going, preacher? I said, I, I have to go out. Well, where are you going? She just wouldn't get off of it. I said, I'm going to the doctor. Well, what's wrong with you? I said, well, I'm just going to the doctor. Well, what's wrong with you? I said, well, they're going to take a flashlight and climb up inside of me and say, what's wrong with me? <laughs> she goes, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, well, we have all kinds of things that go wrong. I had bypass surgery and, and all of that sort of thing. And how do you get your mind off that? He said, set your affections on things above not on things here on the earth. Now back up one page to Philippians 4 and verse 8. And here it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are uh, of good report, and if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. How do I go about keeping my mind on these things? Now, Paul is saying, for me to live is Christ. He said, to die, that's gain. That's even better. Really? And listen to it. He said, I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He said, I've got my mind on going out to meet the Lord. Takes my mind off all of the arthritis and the bursitis and and all these things that torment us now. Now the Bible says when we get saved, therefore if any man be in Christ, or if we be risen with Christ, we become new creatures in Christ Jesus. 
And he says, as new creatures, old things are going to pass away and all things are going to become new. When I got saved on the assembly line of General Motors, suddenly everything changed. I got a brand new attitude. And I just started looking at things different. And I got a brand new outlook, too. I began to think. I had my heart set on becoming president of General Motors. I was going to do such a good job on the assembly line that they'd move me up to the main office and they'd probably make me plant superintendent and they'd see all my qualities and all of the benefits and they'd send me out to Detroit and put me on the 10th floor with a $10 million salary and 10 secretaries. And that was all settled. That was going to be my life. And the Lord tapped me on the shoulder and said, that's not what I got for you, buddy. I want you to quit your job, sell your house, Take your wife and little baby and go down south and go to Bible college. Won't you be a preacher? And I did it. I'm convinced I'd be in my grave right now if I hadn't done that. But now he says, I want you to realize that you're a brand new creature now. And you're going to have new ambitions. You're not going to worry about being $10 million salary and 10 secretaries and presidents. No, no. And I've got new motives, too. And I've got some brand new goals. And i got some brand new habits. I had to quit a whole lot of stuff that I was doing. Because if I'd continue those things, I was doing something that would have rotted my liver. And that would have taken off 10 or 15 years of my life. And I was doing something that was messing up my lungs. And that would have messed me and sent me to my grave earlier. And I was doing some things that would have fouled up my brain. And, and I really got all kinds of diseases from some of the things. I, but I got new habits. And then I had brand new interests. And I got some brand new music, too. I quit listening to some of that stuff down in Nashville. That's where I live. And those old boys with that guitar sing. Somebody came to my house and they stole my pickup truck and they took my wife and they got my dog. And they say if you buy one of those records and play it backwards, you get your dog back, you get your wife back, you get your pickup truck back. <laughs> but I quit listening to that stuff. And I learned that the amazing grace and love lifted me and that joy, joy, joy. And then I got some brand new desires and I got new expression. My expression changed on my face. I never had a smile in my life. And all of a sudden I started smiling and I got a pleasant expression. One thing I like about this church is it's filled with good expressions. Your preacher is just a great example of it. And he's, everybody's picked it up, the singing and all of that. And then I got a brand new appearance too. I wasn't, I wasn't happy being sloppy and slotchy looking and, and dragging along like nothing had mattered. I, I want to straighten up. I represent Jesus. And man, I want to be clean. I, I start taking baths and shaving and brushing the teeth. I even got some B.O. stuff and put it under my arm. I want to be different now. I am a believer in Christ. And so I, I got a brand new appearance. And then I got a brand new hope and a brand new destiny. Now I'm not going to go to hell. Now I'm going to heaven. And I got some brand new friends because the folks I run around with didn't want anything to do with me. And I some folks started graduating to me who believed the Bible and wanted to be in the same frame that I was. New opportunities opened up, new challenges, and a hundred new things besides those. And the Bible says, I found a little verse in Revelation 21, Behold, I make all things new. And I hope you are a new creature, and if you understand what that means, and I hope that you're enjoying the benefits of it, because that's what he's talking about. Now, uh, at my age level, somebody asked, do you sleep well? I said, I take six or seven naps every night. And when I used to wake up, uh, I would just kind of grip my teeth and say, I wish I could stay asleep, man. I've got all kinds of things to do tomorrow. And, then, and, and it just pressured and bothered me. And then one day I was reading and meditating on the story of the rich man who fared sumptuously every day and he died and went to hell. And then it says an old beggar sitting outside the gate there. And, and that poor old beggar, it was in burlaps and rags. And he was begging and trying to get crumbs from the rich man's table. And some old dogs were coming and licking his sores. And he was dirty and he smelled bad and everybody avoided him. And everybody wished he'd go away and not be there. And all that he had going for him was that he was saved and on his way to heaven. And the Bible says the angels came 
and scooped him up and carried him up through to the third heaven and presented him spotless and faultless before the throne of God, before Almighty God. And I got to thinking about that. that one of the times when I wake up, now maybe tomorrow morning about 2.30, 3 or 4 o'clock, my room is going to light up with 10,000 candlewatts of power and a beautiful angel, or maybe more than one, will be there in my room. And they, he's going to say what, what they always say every time in the Bible one shows up and now don't be afraid. Fear not now, fear not. And when that angel shows up, he's going to be the most beautiful creature I've ever seen, glowing and glistening and glittering with a beautiful white robe that's shining brighter than the sun. And he's going to smile at me and say, Now, Tom, Almighty God has sent me down here to get you, and I'm going to take you up into the presence of the Lord. He's going to put those beautiful feathered wings around me. It's going to be the softest and most comfortable, and just, and I'm going to be transferred into my glorified body, and he'll take me right through my ceiling. And then he's going up past the moon, and he's going to say to me, Now, Tom, don't worry about how cold it is. It's about 25,000 degrees below zero. But don't worry about that. You're in your glorified body, and heat's, I mean, cold's not going to bother you. Then we're going past the sun, and it's 25,000 above zero. And don't worry about that. That's not going to bother you either. If you were in your normal body, you'd just melt and evaporate and wouldn't be anything left of you. But you're in your glorified body. And then he's going to remind me, don't worry about how fast we're going. We're going 10,000 times the speed of light. But you can still get your breath. You don't need to breathe because you, in your glorified body, you don't have to have breathing. And then he's going to get me there and set me down. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never experienced anything like that. And I am looking forward to it. It's going to be the most wonderful adventure that I have ever experienced. And I'm setting my affections on that thinking. And when I wake up during the night, I start saying, Lord, do you have one of those angels right now? Lord, send me that one that slew 185,000 of Sennacherib's army. <laughs> May he be the right one to carry me up to heaven. Now, I've been all kind of loop-de-loops and merry-go-rounds at the fairs and all the thing, and those strip lines and all that. But I've never experienced anything like an adventure of an angel carrying me up through space up to heaven. And I'm thinking about that. And it's done something for me. Okay, but not only adventure, but I'm going to enter into a brand new atmosphere. The Bible says that the throne of God, everybody there is completely filled with the Spirit of God. They're all in their glorified bodies. In Ephesians 6, it says, Now don't be drunk with wine or under the control of substances like alcohol and drugs and tobacco. Don't get under control of all that and get habits like that. But be filled or controlled and dominated by the Holy Spirit. Now remember, our body is the Spirit of God. Know ye not that your body is the Spirit of God that dwells in you and you're not your own? You've been bought with a price. The Scripture says your body is the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. And Jesus said, Behold, I stand and knock at your door and if you'll hear me and open the door, I'll come in and now, do you mean to tell me that I have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, all three in me, the Trinity? Yes. And He's in you too if you're saved. All three parts of God is in me. And so the Bible says, now with that, I'm going to be giving forth with the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And each one of those, when we get to the presence of the Lord, everybody there, Moses and Elijah and David and uh, Elijah and Elisha and Isaiah and Jeremiah and then all Peter, Paul and James and John and my first wife that's been there for 20 years. When she was dying, I said to her, honey, uh, listen now, you're going to be in heaven in just a few seconds, but don't you worry, I'm going to be there with you in a split second. As far as you're concerned. But as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to have to wait a little while. It's been almost 20 years. But as far as she's concerned, it's still right now. There's no time factor, no calendars, no clocks. And so when I get into that atmosphere, everybody there is 100% full of love. Can you imagine 
everybody total love like God is love means everybody's going to be equal with God is the level of love and then 100% joy 100% peace 100% and all nine of those fruits and everybody there you talk about an atmosphere I've been in a lot of spiritual revival flavored services but I've never been in anything like that where everybody's there. And think about it. Nobody there is grumpy. Nobody is grouchy. Nobody's complaining. Nobody, no gossip there, no slander, no selfishness. There's no anger, no greed, no hatred. There's no lusting, no, gov- no gluttony. There's no fake news there, no covetousness, no slothfulness, no mean-spirited. Nobody's lying. There's no deceitfulness, nobody's crying, no pain, no arthritis, no bursitis, no sickness, no sorrow, no blindness, no deafness, no glasses, no hearing aids, no crutches, no wheelchairs, no hospice, no unbelievers, no unrighteousness, no backbiting, and no pride, and no wickedness, and no envy, and no maliciousness, and no boasting, and no broken bones, and no heartache attacks, and no strokes, no pneumonia, no cancer, no COVID, no flu, no cold, no coughing, no sneezing no allergies and a hundred more no's if I had time it's all gone I've never been to a place like that and so I'm thinking on that I'm setting my affections on that at 2 or 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock now usually I wake up every hour but I get up and take an ibuprofen and then I sleep 3 hours (laughs) but it doesn't bother me because every time I wake up I say oh boy now I can think about heaven some more So I've got this new adventure in front of me, and I've got this new atmosphere waiting on me. And then, thirdly, I've got a new accommodation. Listen to uh, John 14, 2. In my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, where I am, there you might be also. Now I'm trying to, I'm trying to, Picture my mansion. How many bedrooms? Let's see, let's have 15 or 20 of them. Now, what in the world do you want with a bedroom? You're not going to sleep. There's not going to be any bedrooms there. How about a bathroom? You're not going to need that either. What about, you're not going to need that either. The Bible says everything will be totally different. Okay? Nothing's going to be the same. All right? Uh, uh, Think about, uh, I don't know... (laughs) There are just so many questions that pop into my mind. Now, the Lord gave the Apostle Paul a strange adventure. Um, he went out, to, he was preaching, and they didn't like what he was saying, so they started stoning him, and they, they killed him. The Bible theologians agree that Paul got killed and was drug out and thrown out in the trash heap at Troas. And then when the disciples went out there, he just suddenly got up and brushed himself off and went away with them. And he didn't mention it for 14 years. And 14 years later, he said, Now, I knew a man. I don't know if he's in the body or out of the body. And he was talking about himself. He said, I don't know, but he was caught up into the third heaven. Now, the three heavens, the atmosphere above us, and then the stellar heavens where stars and planets, we call it space. And then there's a third heaven. And Paul was caught up there, and he said... I saw things, felt things, and and, and got experience in things, and it's not possible for me. He used the word legal here. He says it's not it's not legal for me or not possible for me to tell you. What he's saying was, I don't have any nouns or any verbs, I don't have any adverbs, I don't have any phrases, I don't have any sentences that I could use to help you understand what I saw. He say it's so different there that we just don't have the capacity with the human mind to comprehend. And that's what's up there now. Now, in order to understand that, I got to meditating on that, and I thought, I've got a fellow got a whole backyard full of beehives. His name is Joel Powers, and I said, I'm going to go down to Joel's house and say, Joel, can I borrow one of your worker bees? And I know what he's going, what in the world do you want with it? I said, I'll tell you later. Joe, just give me one of them. So he gets a little bee and gives it to me. Now, I'm going to take for granted that I have the supernatural power to change that little old bee into a human being and make a man out of him. And then I'm going to take him to my closet. He's going to be a 43 regular, 
I'm going to make him the way I want him to be. <laughs> okay. And I'm going to give him one of my suits, and I'm going to put a white shirt and tie on him and give him some shoes. And then I'm going to take him out to one of our steakhouses. We call it Demos, the best steaks in Murfreesboro. And I'm going to get him a 12-ounce sirloin, and I get him a baked potato with butter and cream, and then I'm going to get him a salad with some olive garden dressing on that. And then I'm going to get him some coffee and a piece of uh, uh, chocolate pie, and uh, and I want him to experience that. And then I'm going to let him have, I'm going to go get him a Lincoln Town car. And I'm going to put him on a Learjet and let him fly out to Los Angeles and back. And then I'm going to get him on a cruise down in the Caribbean. And etc. Just all the things that everybody does, you know. And that's all over. Now I'm going to change him back and stick him back in the beehive and let him try to explain to all of those little bees what he got involved in. <laughs> those little bees go, we don't get it. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense to us. Okay, now that's sort of what it's going to be like. But we're in store for a brand new, a brand new, uh, uh, accommodations. And then there's, we're going to have a brand new anatomy. The Bible says that our physical body is going to be replaced with a spiritual body. It says your mortal will put on immortality and your corruptible body will be made incorruptible. Now, I've never had anything like that. And I am looking forward to having an immortal body and an incorruptible body. Never have an earache or a toothache or never have no glasses, no hearing aids, no false teeth. No. I don't know about some of you older folk, but I put more stuff in the drawer at night than I put in the bed. No more of that. <laughs> Glorified body. Just think about it. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to be dressed in a beautiful white robe, and it's going to be shining. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3 indicates that there's a degree of shining among believers. and <clears throat> says that we will shine as the brightness of the firmament. Anybody saved is going to have a glow of brilliance like the brightness of the firmament. Now, now the firmament is talking about the atmosphere above the earth, and the sun shines on it from up in there, and it lights it up. Now, we didn't think about the earth shining until we had a man go out on the moon take a picture, and we saw that beautiful picture of the earth from space, and we saw it was shining. Now, it doesn't shine as bright as the moon or the sun, but it does shine. But it is not near as bright as the moon, and not near. But then the next part of that verse says, they that turn many to righteousness, or those that influence or encourage or win somebody else to the Lord will shine like stars. And our sun is one of the dim stars. And it says that some believers are going to shine like stars forever and forever. Now, I think that's saying that somebody here, I'm going to see you and you'll have a five-watt face because there's five people in heaven because you did something to try to help or encourage them in some way. And over here, somebody with a 10-watt place, and there's a 25 and 50 and 100. And while we're all talking, suddenly it starts to light up and coming our way. It's beautiful. And, and D.L. Moody walks up. He won a million. Imagine how bright. The Bible indicates to me in that verse that the glow that we're going to have in our glorified body for all of eternity is going to be determined by the amount of impact or influence that we had because we believe we ought to be trying to help other people go to heaven, but just not taking all we can get for gimme, 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 gimme for me. And the Bible teaches death itself and un, you know, unselfishness and so forth. So I'm going to get a new anatomy. Now it's going to glow and glisten. I'm going to have it. I'm going to be like Moses and Elijah came down on Matthew 17 on Mount Moriah and Jesus appeared and was transformed into his glorified form. And at, and uh, Elijah and Moses were glowing and glistening and shining like neon tubes. Peter, James, and John got so excited about it, they wanted to build three big shrines up there. And Jesus said, no, that's not what this is all about. And we need to go back down and help people. So I've, I've got this new adventure ahead of me. I've got this new atmosphere I'm looking forward to. I'm going to have a brand new accommodation. And I'm going to have a brand new anatomy. And then I'm going to see a brand new architecture. Listen to this. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And the Bible says in verse 10, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven. Now think about it, if you will, that wonderful place. Uh, the Bible calls says the builder and maker is God. And they tell us that the Holy of Holies, now we have in the Old Testament, the tabernacle had the courtyard and the holy place, and the Holy of Holies was 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. The New Jerusalem is 1,500 miles and 1,500 miles and 1,500 miles, wide and high and, and long. Uh, it's like a cube. Uh, that's like saying this city is going to be from New York City all the way down to Dallas. And it's going to be all the way from Maine to Florida. And it's going to be as high as it is broad and long. That's a big city. It is the size of the moon, according to some figures. Uh, it is pictured like a beautiful, beautiful bride coming down to meet her new husband. That's the most beautiful time of a girl's life. And that's the picture he uses. Uh, it has 144 cute or 216 square feet walls around it. Uh, there are 12 gates, three on each side with an angel and a sword to keep anybody from going in there. We call them the pearly gates made out of beautiful pearls. It is figured out that it is 2,250,000 square miles of space. That's 15,000 times the size of London, England. Henry Morris, a great Bible teacher, said that he believes there are 100 billion people that will have lived on the earth from Adam all the way through till the rapture takes place or the end comes. And he says about 20% of them in his estimate or figure, and we don't know how he could come up with these figures, but he says about 20 billion out of 100 billion will probably be saved. So we're looking for about 20 billion people in heaven, according to his estimate. Now, each person there in that case would be able to have a cubic block, and you will have 75 acres in the New Jerusalem that's yours. <laughs> now, now I, I don't know if you're interested in that future real estate that God has promised us, but it's an amazing place. It's 3,960 stories high. Now that means that the human body, after we are glorified, we'll be able to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord instantaneously. Now you don't have to wait on the streetcar or wait on the red light. You just zip and you're there. Okay, same thing about going up. Vertically, you could be on the 3,960 floor just by thought. You're there. Now, I get excited about that kind of adventure. That's the New Jerusalem. Now, it has 12 foundations. And if you'll study those 12 stones in the breastplate of the great high priest in the Old Testament, each one of them is a diamond and a sapphire. And those are worth fortunes in our time. And each one of those is going to be a solid, and I think maybe a foot high or two feet or three feet foundation under this new city, all the way from Denver back to New York City and all the way from Toronto down to Miami. And each one of those beautiful sparkling, representing the 12 tribes of Israel, are going to be laid there as a foundation for that beautiful city. Now you talk about fortune. And uh, when we think about, you know, a little diamond, four or five thousand dollars, somebody pays to get the wife a beautiful diamond ring. And think about a diamond uh, a foot thick, you know, for fifteen hundred miles, fifteen hundred miles there. And then stack it on top and have twelve of those all stacked up and build that city. And, and then the Bible says there's no sun or moon there and no light because Jesus is the light thereof. And he is making it glorify, and it is all transparent, glassy kind of solid gold. I'm going to have a gold doorknob on my mansion and a gold driveway. I don't know what I need a driveway for, and I'm going to have a car. <laughs> but it just fascinates me to try to think about some of this stuff. 
So I got this new architecture that I'm going up there and look over. And then also, I've got a new astronomical cosmos waiting. Listen to this, Revelation 21.1. I saw the new heaven. New heaven? What's wrong with the old one? What's wrong with the one we got? I'm looking forward to going to heaven, but now wait a minute. The Bible says that the accuser brethren, the devil, goes up to the throne of God and says, Now God, that, that fellow Job down there, he's your pet. And you're, you're, if, if you'd let me get hold of him for a little while, he'll curse you to your face. He, he, he's not who you think he is. And you remember the story how the Lord allowed Job uh, to have all that in order to prove the point. Now remember, the story of Job in the Bible is not about Job, it's about me. It's about you. My wife was dying. My second wife was dying with COVID. And she said, Tom, you, you, you think this is something that I've done wrong or something we're doing wrong? I said, honey, you ever read about Job? She said, well, sure. I said, well, that didn't have nothing to do with Job. And this doesn't have anything to do with you and me. I said, Second Corinthians 4, 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. And the Lord allows things to come. You remember Romans 8, 28? All things. Would that include that? Yeah. All things. Everything that happens. If my house burns down, a tornado comes and blows it away, or I fall and break my leg, or I have a car wreck and break my back up. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord according to His purpose. And nothing's going to happen to me that's not arranged and allowed of God for a reason and so if I groan, now once in a while I say, Lord, I, I got bursitis in my hip, Lord, it hurts. And he said, Tom, what do you expect at 93 and a half? <laughs> but the Lord uses these things. He sends us to school, teaching us some things that otherwise, and we're going to be rewarded for our attitude and our way of coping and handling it and adjusting it. If we moan and cry and blame God and say God's not fair, we're missing the point. If we handle it just right, the Lord's going to say, well done, you did a good job showing people how they're supposed to respond. And the Lord told me one time in my heart, listen, I'm going to give you some troubles because I want you to teach people how you're supposed to react when you have this kind of problem because you're going to be ministering to a lot of people who have problems. And I had a little, little lady that was dying and she had really suffered and I said, I, I said, Barbara, uh, you know, when you get to heaven, you're going to get your glorified body and you're going to jump up and down, kick your heels together and clap your hands and just, you're just going, man, this glorified body is so much better, all that stuff. And I said, now I'm going up to heaven and I'm going to say, yeah, <laughs> this glorified body is pretty nice. I've never been sick. Yeah, this is pretty nice. I want to appreciate mine near as much as Barbara. And sometimes the Lord is working to teach me some things like that. But anyhow, we're going to get this brand new heaven. Remember in Daniel chapter 9, when uh, Daniel prayed, and he was a praying this man in the Old Testament, and uh, the Bible says 21 days later an angel showed up and said, Daniel, we heard your prayer, and the very minute you prayed, God dispatched me to answer it. And I was in them my way, and I came... Down through heaven and right at the edge of heaven, I ran into a curtain of fallen angels, demons. And I couldn't get through. And I had to call for an archangel to bring some reinforcement. We fought our way through and it took us 21 days. And now I'm here to answer your prayer. All that's going on in heaven? Yes. And God is not going to take me to a heaven like that. He's going to give me a brand new heaven. That has The devil's going to be down in the lake of fire along with all those fallen angels. Read Second Peter. And we get a new heaven. And then, then we also are going to get a new earth. The scripture says in uh, Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. Second Peter says this new earth is going to fly off, or this old earth is going to fly off into space and burn up. He promises, I'm not ever going to destroy the earth again with water, but I'm going to destroy it with fire. And it's going to be gone because this earth is under the curse. And you remember when Moses came down on the mountain to give, I mean, when God came down to give Moses the Ten Commandments, Exodus 19 and 20, 
the mountain blew up like a volcano and, and fire and, and just, just terrible. You know what was going on? The holiness of God was coming in contact with the sin-cursed earth. And that's the reaction. That's why I cannot get into the presence of God in this body because it would explode. It would burn and melt and now just evaporate because holiness cannot come contact. God is not going to let me come up there and mess up heaven. He's going to give me a glorified body. And I'm going to enter into a new heaven and we're going to come back with Jesus on white horses to establish a new earth. We're going to have a millennial reign when everything's going to be perfect and it's going to be beautiful. So I've got all this new stuff. So I wake up two or three o'clock in the morning and I say, Lord, you want to come? Can I come now? It reminds me, we were having our family devotions and we had our four children. I have four kids. We got Debbie and Tom and Tim and Donna. Donna was our little three-year-old. Right now she's a grandmother and a pastor's wife down in Panama City, Florida. But then she was only three years old. She was sitting at the table and I was talking about heaven. And uh, all the kids were zeroing in on it. And uh, my wife was listening and I was trying to paint a picture of what's coming for us. And little Donna said, I said, shh, it's devotions, Donna. Don't, we're having devotions. Save it later. <laughs> I said, not Donna, not now. Save it. <laughs> she, she wouldn't quit. I said, okay, all right, what is it? She said, Daddy, why don't we just go up there right now? She had a great idea. And I think every time I wake up, I say the same thing. Why couldn't I go up there right now? Why wait? I want to set my affections on things up, not on things down here. I don't worry about insurance policies and deeds and wills and inheritances and and, and retirements and all that. You can think of all that stuff. We spend about 90% of our time on that and sometimes more than that. Sometimes people spend all their time on stuff and things and all that worry and chew their fingernails and they get angry and mad and mad. I want to not think, think on these things, okay? Now that's what Paul's trying to teach us. And I'm hoping I can learn that. And maybe somebody here will learn that. Would you pray with me? Let's bow our heads together. And it might be that somebody does not know absolutely, positively, 100% sure that you'd go to heaven if you died right now. If that's the case, I'm going to suggest that Jesus came, He was God incarnate in a human body, and He was born of the virgin, lived without sin, and didn't get the sinful nature that you have and I have. And uh, he lived without sin and died on the cross and was buried. And then he rose again the third day to prove that he was God. And then he went back to heaven. And then he said, if you will come and let me know you want me to, I'll give you the free gift of eternal life. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to get be, be baptized. You don't have to join the church. You don't have to quit doing any bad thing. You don't have to start doing any good things. But if you will just let me give you the gift of eternal life, I'll come into your heart and then you'll be a new creature and everything will change. Old things will start passing away and new things will be coming new to you. And if you'll just let me give it to you, then I'll tell you what else I'll do. I'll put your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and make a reservation. And when you get up to heaven, they'll check in the Book of Life and your name is there. It says, if your name's not in there, they're going to cast you into the lake of fire. But if your name's in that book, you're in. And if you are not positively sure your name's in the book, I suggest that you take care of it right now. You can right there where you sit without opening your eyes. You don't need to move your lips. You just whisper a prayer to God and let Him know that you would like to invite Him or welcome Him into your life. He'll come and give you the gift of eternal life. And here's a prayer. Dear Lord, if you're not in my heart right now, if there's some reason that you are not in my heart, would you please come in right now? I do believe you died for me on the cross and was buried and rose again. And I want to ask you to put my name in the book of life, make a reservation for me, and I'm going to trust you. And now, Lord, I pray you'll help me to understand this and that you'll explain it all to me and help me to know how to respond. I'm going to trust you with my
my Savior.